getting to know you, getting to know all about you. check with special effects. All right, darling, you do that. Hi, everyone. I'm Andy. Welcome to Furniture Fables. Q and A. Well, it's official. I have been here on YouTube for one year, and it seems like a perfect time to just take a few minutes and go ahead and answer some of the questions that I have been receiving all along. I've got quite a few of them gathered here over here on my laptop, so why don't we just go ahead and dive right in. I am genuinely curious about your name. I hope it's not a rude question, but I've never met a woman named Andy. Is it short for something? Well, thank you for the question. Absolutely not rude at all. Yes, Andy is short for Andrea. It's actually my full middle name. My first name is Mary. I was named in the same kind of spirit or style as my grandma, whose name was Mary Louise, and who always went by her middle name, went by Louise. I think my folks kind of had that same idea that they would call me Andrea, but I think very quickly they decided that I was Andy. I will answer to Andrea absolutely uh, especially my mother if I'm in trouble and I know I'm in big trouble if I hear Mary Andrea Mary Andrea <laughs> then I know I'm in hot water hi mom <laughs> growing up with a name that like that that could be used for a boy or a girl was at times challenging I remember being told a lot by other kids that's not a girl's name it's a boy's name and I would sometimes go to my mom or dad and say, they say that's not a girl's name. And I remember my mom saying to me, well, you know what you can tell them, just tell them it's my name. So that makes it a girl's name. Uh, and so I think that was a very empowering thing to hear. Thank you, mom. I make it a girl's name because it's my name and I'm a girl. There you go. There's been a lot of good guesses. Somebody asked me, are or were you ever an English professor? Hmm. I think I really would have liked that, but alas and alack, no. You have correctly picked up on the fact that I clearly love literature. Children's literature in particular is something that is very, very near and dear to my heart. Were you a theater major? Ooh, uh, I thought about it. But no, I actually was a music major. I went to UC Santa Cruz, go banana slugs, and was majoring actually in cultural anthropology. But last minute I switched over to music and that was really what I always really, really wanted to do. I have loved music and studied music my whole life ever since I was a little kid. When I was a child, I took violin and piano and I also discovered my deep love of singing and I studied classical voice from the time I was a teenager all through college and on through graduate school. While I was finishing up that degree in music with that emphasis in voice, I discovered I actually had this other passion, which was conducting. I was really, really fortunate. I got to study with a fabulous professor there at UC Santa Cruz and decided to go on and pursue my master's degree in choral conducting. I went 
to the other side of the country and went to the Yale School of Music where I met my future husband who was getting his master's degree in composition, composer, conductor. And we've been making beautiful music. <laughs> oh, God. Probably one of my all-time favorite roles is as vocal director for musical theater. I am currently the resident vocal director for a company here right in the South Bay. And honestly, it is kind of like where all lines converge into one fantastic point for me because it takes my absolute passion and love of music, most and especially of vocal music, as well as storytelling, because is there any greater storytelling art form than theater? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, it combines everything. The acting, the dancing, people break into song randomly. There's costumes and sparkly sequins. And it's just the most amazing thing. And the people are so much fun. Theater people are the best. They are so much fun. <laughs> Okay, John, a lot of people ask me about John. He's pretty cute, he's a pretty nice guy, I gotta say. Still John. Um, he was just a really nice guy. He's right there, his head's kind of chopped off in that shot. You know, that's our, this is our engagement photo, which we thought was really kind of cheesy. Cute. Cute. Look how cute, oh my gosh, look how young we were. Good grief. He's the composer type. He is happy to stay in a dark hole somewhere writing. People like me take and go, I will bring it to life now. Someone find me a podium and I will bring it to life. It's a very telling kind of accurate representation of our personalities. So we were at the welcome back picnic. We were at some quad somewhere on the campus. It looks a lot like Hogwarts. It's that look, which for me growing up in the Bay Area in California was just mind blowing because nothing looks like that here. <laughs> Everything's relatively new. One of my favorite things was to just look at the buildings. But in any case, we were on the quad, you see, and um, mm. it was this lovely green lawn. I was sitting on the grass with some friends and we were chatting and I kind of looked up and looked across the quad and there was this really cute guy. Oh. He was looking over at me and I looked at him and he smiled and I smiled at him. And I went, oh. <laughs> Cut to later that evening and a friend of mine says, oh, there's a great party over at the graduate student housing at such and such, we should go. So we get there and it is dark and there's colored lights flashing and it's packed with, with students and the music is super loud and blaring and boom, boom. You know, blasting and pounding away. And my friends and I are literally trying to make our way through kind of a sea of humanity just to try to find a drink or something. And we kind of decide, like, let's just go. It's just, we can barely hear each other. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. So we start to weave our way, try to, to get out of the party. And I lose track of them. I can't see them. It's all a big, just like loud, pounding mess of people. And, ugh. and I come through people like break here and I come face to face with John and he and I stop and you know that scene in West Side Story It was like everything else just melted away and he and I were alone there. We did not fall into each other's arms and do a dance at that moment, but it was like that. It was like everything else went blurry. Yeah. <laughs> John is very different from me. John is even and a little bit more introverted of a person, more quiet. We just really seem to kind of complement and balance one another really, really well. And 
You know, when I had this idea of creating this channel, which honestly I had kind of rattling around in the back of my head for quite some time before I had the guts to verbalize it. He, of course, was the first person who I told this idea to. And I did so knowing that that trying to explain what I wanted to do might sound completely crazy. He immediately, immediately said, absolutely, you could do that. That is a great idea. You could do that. He believed in me. He has supported me all along during this, this journey of discovery. I count myself, it sounds so cliche, but I do. I just count myself incredibly lucky. He's the most amazing dad in the world to our three girls. And um, I'm just lucky. I'm lucky to have, to have him in my life. So the answer to this very, very popular question is honestly, not really. I have a few favorites that I go back to time and time again because they consistently perform really, really well for me. And I can say this, I have used some more kind of, you know, bargain paints and they are not terrible at all. But I can say that generally, I do feel like the premium paints just perform better. They seem to be more highly pigmented. You get better coverage with less paint and they are really good at the things that you want paint to be good at, which is adherence and drying down to a really tough, strong finish. My favorites in that category would be for sure Fusion Mineral Paint. That's one of my kind of sentimental favorites. I just kind of go back to it again and again. They just have such a great sense of color. Another one that I really like to use is Dixie Bell. I've used them a lot. If you want to do any kind of blending or have all of the freedom in terms of, of blending, shading, sanding back, distressing, a straight up chalk paint is probably what you're gonna want. And Dixie Bell just does those brilliantly. I have had great experience with Melange. I have not used Country Chic all that much, but every single time I have used it, I have loved it. I think I'd like to use more of, of Country Chic. And I have used Wise Owl actually only a couple of times as well. Also really, really liked it. Would like to use that one a little bit more. There is some truth to, you know, paint is paint. But I mean, think about it. The last time you painted a room in your house, what did you choose to do? Did you buy the paint that was absolutely the least expensive or did you opt for the more pricey version in hopes that you would get better coverage faster and it would hold up to kids and pets, etc.? Did you think it was worth it if you, you know, bought the higher priced paint or have did you get a great result with a bargain paint? Well, you know, that's kind of how it is with the furniture paint. It's the same kind of thing. And it's kind of just what you think and feel about it. Where I do really think it for sure makes a difference in what you spend is your brush. So here are some of my favorite brushes. There they are. Um, I love this Stallmeister one that I just have recently got. I'm kind of getting more and more used to it. Here you can see, so densely packed. That's gonna hold a lot of paint. This little brush, this kind of, it's a little thin angled brush by Fusion Mineral Paint is actually one of my favorites. Super clean, accurate, really thin, great little brush. Love that one. Here is a great one by Zebra. This is their two and a half inch, I think, brush. It is great to have a nice big, wide bristled uh, brush because they'll just cover a lot of territory. Zebra's brushes are wonderful and they are usually comparatively a great price point. Um, here's some other zebra ones that I love. Their little square brush, super great. Triangle brush. This shape is so great when you're kind of cutting in. Um, I used it just recently on the Dylan dresser to get in and paint up along those solid wood handles on that M3 
MCM shaped uh, dresser. That was really cool. And then of course this just their basic chiseled wedge brush. You can see that angle right there. And just again, really well packed brushes, a good, good value. If you're kind of just getting started, getting yourself a little set of zebra brushes is a kind of a great idea, I think. So this segues very nicely into this next question. Do you prefer to paint with a brush or a sprayer? Great question. The answer to that question is no, I actually don't have a personal strong preference. Brushing with a paintbrush is the right choice in some situations and busting out the spray gun is better in others. Here's kind of my thinking. As a content creator, I like to use a brush a lot. I feel like a paintbrush is so much more accessible. Everybody can get a hold of a paintbrush and most people already have a paintbrush somewhere in their garage, even right now if, before even thinking or planning to have one. There's just one there, right? People have paintbrushes. There is something so, so easy and simple about shaking up your can of paint opening it up and dipping your brush in and going. There's also something kind of nice and zen about painting with a brush. Because I paint a lot outside with a paintbrush, I know the different dogs that live nearby. I know their I know their barks. I can hear my neighbor who loves to bike coming down our, our road before I ever see him. I know somebody somewhere really loves wind chimes, but the thing I actually love the most is that I know someone is studying flute right now. And I know that because I paint outside and I can hear them practicing the flute as I'm painting. That's just kind of nice. So I like to do a lot of my work with a brush. I feel like that's, that just invites a lot of people in. Now, that said, there is no contest if you want to get it done faster, the sprayer wins. If you do not like brush strokes, the sprayer wins. If you are trying to do a big job, several pieces. If you are doing a dining table and chairs, get a spray gun, get, get the sprayer because painting chairs by hand, several of them, ugh. No, not, not fun. Okay, so why furniture? What got you into furniture? How did you get into that? My entire life, I have loved all things design. I have been a fan of landscape design, architecture, interior design, fashion design. When I was um, in my early, early 20s, my friends would make fun of me. I would watch Martha Stewart living and I would get together with my friends and say, you're not going to believe this. She was doing her tablescape for Thanksgiving and she hollowed out these gourds and she put gold leaf on them and then put the pumpkin soup into the gourds and served it like that. And my friends would say, so what? Why do you care about that? Are, are you going to be, you know, hosting Thanksgiving dinner? No, our moms are doing that. We're young and hot. Andy, what are you doing? Stop obsessing about Martha Stewart. When I would go shopping with, you know, my sisters, my mom, sometimes we might pop into some little kind of smaller boutique -y place or antique store. And occasionally I would see these pieces of furniture that someone had painted. And I would think, how? How does someone do that? What do you do? What kind of paint do you use? How do you know how to do that? Well, back in my day, we didn't have YouTube, but one day I just decided to kind of start. Um, like most folks who do this, I was also very much driven by need. I always say even cheap furniture is expensive. So I just started and I did it the way a lot of people start off. I used whatever leftover latex paint was in my garage <laughs> and I made a lot of things that were pretty bad there's no I mean there's no other way to, to say it they were just kind of bad I mean I just slapped paint on things um, I mean I would just like wipe something down and just slap a coat of paint on it that's how I started slap that paint on them get them painted paint it white
but uh, I can tell you that um, when I was in my early 30s, I was given a desk that had belonged to my grandma and um, after she had passed away and I remembered her sitting at this desk. I can remember her, she would, she loved to write letters. And so her desk was full of all kinds of stationery and cards. Um, and it smelled like her and it had this kind of, it was already painted and it had one of those inset leather tops and it came to me, nobody else wanted it. Um, and I don't think it was particularly valuable, but it was nice. It was a nice desk and I, decided to strip the paint off of it. And um, I got in over my head. I got, I got in over my head. The paint stripper was somewhat successful and somewhat not. I kind of reached this point as I was trying to deal with it and clean it up that I really didn't know what to do with it. And so I had been working on it in the garage and I pulled it out onto the driveway just so it, if anyone went into the garage, the fumes from the stripper wouldn't be, you know, just completely um, clouding the air in the garage. And in California, it almost never rains, but it rained while my grandma's desk was out. And, um, Oh, oh, it makes me cringe thinking about it still. Um, so long story short, it warped and it, it was ruined. I ruined my grandma's desk. I ruined it. Oh, I still feel terrible about that. Oh, when I did that, I genuinely felt ashamed that I had let that happen and that I had done that. And I hung up my furniture makeover flipping um, dreams for a long, long time because of that desk. Here's the thing. <laughs> it was it was a real bummer that I had done that and I should have felt really bad, but, but, if I had to lay a bet, my grandma, if she could have said something to me then and there, she would have said, honey, move on. <laughs> it's fine. It was just a desk. It was kind of a cute desk. It was a nice desk. But honey, move on with your life. It's fine. Get over it. A lot of times people will get very emotional about furniture. And I think perhaps a lot of the time that is where this comes from. We connect furniture to people. And the idea of changing a piece of furniture can be upsetting to a lot of people too. They will get very, very upset about it. Even if literally that piece of furniture was headed for the dump, the landfill, they will still uh, feel that you are somehow dishonoring the past or or ruining something that was about to be thrown away. <laughs> you know, I mean, part of me understands what's at the heart of that, of that feeling, but this is a really important little detail. If you ever decide to, to do this uh, as a hobby or even as a business, because you will run into it for sure. Um, number one, if you own it, you get to do whatever you want with it. Where? Period. There you go. That can be the end of the discussion if you want. But here's another thing to think about. I think about my grandparents, all of my grandparents, and I think they would be delighted with anything that they owned or anything from the era that they lived. Seeing people in the, the modern time refresh it and remake it and make it uh, relevant stylistically and make it work and be actually a useful thing, I think they would be absolutely delighted. And if anybody were to say, but aren't you upset that we aren't keeping this in, you know, uh, like a special hermetically sealed thing to keep it perfect? They say, are you kidding? It's a dresser. There's more important things to worry about. Do what you want to the dresser. 
so after I got over that trauma of, of Grandma Blue's desk, um, just got outside like just about every day I would go out and do something on some project and just slowly and but surely kind of got more and more and more comfortable and confident with what I was doing and then decided that I was ready to try to sell. A lot of um, my Furniture Fables friends will ask me about how do I sell? I sell like a lot of folks. I sell on Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, Nextdoor. I use my Instagram account. I use my Facebook uh, business page. That's really how I sell. I am interested, I have to tell you, in looking into Etsy, as well as maybe a couple of other um, ways of approaching selling. Selling your pieces can be tricky, but if you you have the time to give to that portion of what you're doing, you can do really, really well with it, but you must internalize it. You must understand that selling itself is a job. It takes time, energy, thought, etc. The key to selling probably number one, great pictures. Your pictures have to be clear and nice and attractive and well lit. And so did I just tell you that you have to become a pretty decent photographer? Yes. Um, you also need to be able to write up a really well-written description. Clear, descriptive, but not too wordy. So do you have to be a pretty decent writer? Yes, you do. Do you have to deal with low ballers? Yep. Do you have to deal with just kind of strange interactions? Mm hmm. Yes. Yes, you do. Do you have to deal with having a piece that you thought for sure would sell like that? And it just doesn't. Mysteriously, it sits on the market with having a piece that you didn't know if it would sell at all. And instead you have three offers all at once. And you're trying to figure out how you do this in a fair way and not alienate future buyers. Yes, it's a job. If you are interested in starting and you just kind of say, okay, all of that is really great, but I just, I, I, I don't know how to start. I would say you are living in the golden age of starting in this little cottage industry because there is so much interest in it. It is growing and booming all over the place. And you live in the world of YouTube. There is so much fantastic content right here on YouTube for you, showing you step by step by step how to do this. My number one piece of advice, start with something small and simple. Simple means no moving parts, no doors, no drawers. And then give yourself time. Let yourself take however many weekends it takes for you. Don't worry about the outcome. Don't ask yourself to create some glorious piece of furniture art the first time out or the first few times out. I can tell you that my design ability gets better and better every single time I do this. And there is a whole huge amount of this process that I never show on my fables because it is me sitting and looking at the piece. Just, just, I'm, I sit and I look, I look at the piece. And then I, I kind of go over here and I look at it from this side. And then I look at it from this side and I sit there and I sip my drink and I stare at it some more. And it's like that for a couple of hours. Because to me, one of the most important techniques in all of this is looking at the piece and deciding what is it about this piece that is good? What is it about this piece that still is valuable? Looking at these pieces, these busted, broke down, pieces left on the side of the road and deciding what is it about them that is redeemable and and could still be valuable to someone that is where the heart really of this job is if you can do that you can learn all of the other stuff and of course you can do that because all of that takes is just a little thoughtfulness a little time 
I have to know, have to know how you came up with Biff. Biff. Ooh, people love Biff. The ladies love Biff. <laughs> If you wanna know something really, really funny, um, just completely by happenstance, every time Biff has uh, been here for a shoot, it has just so happened that it has coincided with John being out of town. Not planned for, I promise, I swear. It just happened that way. So John has never come face to face in real life with Biff. That might be fun to capture on camera sometime. All right, well, I must give credit where credit is due. My dad came up with the idea of a soap opera, a story within the story, and he named it. He named it, he said, as the paint dries. And I just about fell off my chair laughing. And it just so happened that I was at the point where I had decided I was gonna tackle that big, huge, ginormous china hutch that I had found literally by the side of the road, if you'll remember. I had decided to split that big guy up and do two separate pieces, turn the top into its own piece and do something with that lower uh, buffet. As soon as I heard the words in my brain break up, that phrase and the the idea of soap opera kind of came together and they started swirling around together. <laughs> Break up, soap opera. And suddenly it just started writing itself. I saw the top as the female character. She eventually was named Painterly and the bottom character, the Buffet, was the dude and they were breaking up. And um, Buffet, he just seemed like he needed to be named Biff. When Biff first appeared, um, I wasn't quite sure about his long story. And um, I thought, well, I just need, I just need to, I just need to be able to do Biff really quickly. I need to be able to do a dude really, really quickly. So I just grabbed John's hat. I took some brown eyeliner and I I got in the mirror and I just you know, put it off my chin and, and mustache and stuff like that. And then I went and got in front of the camera and I did a few takes and then I went back and looked at it and it was terrible. I mean, I mean, I mean, ridiculously terrible. It turns out it is not just a beard, you know, that looks masculine. I realized my neck, you know, my neck looks really feminine. Obviously, you know, I shot from here up but um, I needed to add some some shadow here, right, for that brow ridge. It was a whole big thing, and so I really quickly tried to put together a semi-decent -de look for Biff. My hair was just literally kind of up, tucked up under the hat. Um, Biff, Biff was rough in his first appearance. He was, he was rough. I acted my heart out, though. But then I realized that uh, Biff really had a storyline that needed to happen. And as I wrote it, I realized Biff would fall into despair. I'm nothing without you. Interly, you know, she bounced back pretty quick. She was the one who really broke it off. Okay, Biff, this is getting unattractive. And so she really kind of thrived as soon as she broke up, which can often happen. And um, Biff really took a turn for the worse and he winds up in a pile of, as Painterly says, dead leaves and beetle dung. Um, and she finds him there and he's he's quite a fright. He needs some um, de-lousing shampoo and razor blades and some, you know, soap. But Biff cleans up pretty well. And uh, he, he ends up kind of looking a lot like Justin Bieber. <laughs> a little bit, maybe. <laughs> I have to tell you though, that Biff is absolutely thrilled. He is so happy to have learned the amount of joy that his chest hair has brought to so many. It just brings him so much happiness to know that. And um, he says, hey, especially to you ladies, hey. Biff says, hey. Biff. Love your alter ego. <laughs> How did she come into being? Oh, okay, this is kind of fun. Well, all right, when I decided to start my channel, I had all of these wacky ideas, these kind of quirky ideas, and I wanted to write uh, some 
of these kind of skit ideas, things that would weave into the theme of the storytelling of the piece of furniture. The piece of furniture really being kind of the star of each episode. Um, but I realized that I was going to need other people to really do some fun stuff. And as soon as I kind of realized that and looked up, my family scattered, <laughs> which is really annoying because, you know, they, they can act, but they mostly don't really want to do that, which I completely respect. I completely respect that. Um, so as I was facing all of these uh, realities and yet still really wanting to try this wacky idea, a thought occurred to me. And that thought was, well, I could do all of the parts. Hmm. And the more I thought about that, the more I thought, well, that could be really fun and maybe even add to the funniness of the whole thing. And I kind of sat with that idea for a while and this character, this person began to take shape in my mind. She is kind of an amalgam. She's a fantastic, gorgeous blend of <laughs> of many, many characters. I'm a huge fan of the show Absolutely Fabulous. She's a little bit um, Eddie. Really? And Patsy. Yes, darling, but isn't there some spry young child who could be handling this? Uh, I like British comedy. Um, she's a little bit Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> oh, darling! She definitely has some Julia Child. Mm, darling, you must taste this. Try some. Love Julia Child. Um, she's got a little dash of Cruella de Vil, maybe? And uh, Meryl Streep, uh, Double Wears Prada. Think rather highly of yourself, don't you, darling? She's, she's kind of, you know, she's a blend of all of that. She's got a little dash of motherly, grandmotherly um, helpfulness going somewhere. She's not evil or bad or anything, or at least two. Apparently she has done some kind of major art thievery. She knows how to rock climb. She seems to know Amazons and giant rabbits. Ooh, that rabbit! He owes me money, you know. Um, <clears throat> your imagination is a wonderful thing. Um, if you are interested in creating a YouTube channel, make it interesting, make it yours. For me, there is something so perfect about the unwanted piece of furniture as our hero slash protagonist. I think that we as human beings, we all just kind of universally love the underdog and we love um, a story about something or someone who is truly transformed. That is such a hopeful idea, I think, to all of us. And the telling of that story of the journey of this piece of furniture with all of the struggles, the foibles, the mistakes, the little victories, um, the very human element of what it is to take a little table and, and try to make it something someone might love again is there's just a lot there, there, right? There's just a whole lot there for us to enjoy. Well, I think we've come to a good stopping point. Thank you all so much for all of your questions. Oh, darling. Yes? It's do it time. Ah, okay. Ready, darling? Yep. I have love and it's all that I need. Right or wrong? Maybe something a little lighter or friendlier. Lighter? Is that really the mood you're going for, darling? Yeah. Here, how about this? Pictures. You just remember what your front face.
was a song parody and thus free from any copyright issues. I hope so too. Well friends, I think that brings us to the end of season three, but don't worry, I will be back very, very soon. Thank you so much for all of your very enthusiastic support of my channel. You make it possible with your views, subscriptions, and engagement. Make sure to watch this fable all the way to the end if you'd like to see all the before and afters from this season, as well as a sneak peek of the new fable heading your way soon. In that meantime, I hope that you and yours are well. Take care, friends, and I will see you next time for more Furniture Fables.